Hello, welcome back to another lecture on multivariate analyses. I should say another of the lectures on this course, Methods in Experimental Ecology. This is the last lecture of our series, and I think it's important that you understand the basics of multivariate analyses because they're widely used in ecology. Uh, they're uh, very convenient at condensing lots of complex information down to something that can be easily described. That's really the purpose of multivariate analyses, to describe complex patterns. As you might guess from some of these plots, you can get a lot of information conveyed in them very quickly. The one on the left shows a cluster analysis, a hierarchical cluster analysis. It's analogous to things you would see in a phylogeny where this is taking multivariate data about uh, different measures of cars and uh, starting to group them together. And you can see that there's some big divisions first uh, and then lots of other finer clusterings where it's nested. You have subsets inside subsets. And then the one on the right is showing an example of a multivariate analysis called principal components analysis where multiple genotypes uh, were collected from 12 microsatellites in uh, wolves in Ontario. And as you might guess, there's some overlap in these two populations, but this population in Northeast Ontario is a bit different from the other two populations. And it's very nicely, very efficiently conveyed with this simple graphic. And that's the point, to try to reduce this complex set of data down to something that's fairly clean and simple, but represents the data well. Okay. So I've already been talking a little bit about why we should be doing multivariate analyses, and then I'm going to get around to talking about some general categories that exist for them. Uh, there's ordination, the uh, graph I was just showing you with the colors on it. There's discriminant analysis, which I think is sort of a bridge um, in, in a way between ordination and the next one, cluster analysis. And then MANOVA, which is a multivariate version of analysis of variance that you've already been using. Uh, and there's another attempt, uh, not attempt, it's a good way, it's just not just an attempt, to deal with multivariate analysis when you can uh, re let go a little bit of the assumptions that go along with ANOVA uh, called permutation-based MANOVA or PERMANOVA. And so I'll show you that one really briefly too. These kinds of data, remember, are going to be coolly, nicely showing these complex patterns. And if you can get a nice 3D plot like this, and this is a canonical varied analysis, and the kind of thing where you can say these are discrete groups in these different colors that you expect a priori for canonical varied analysis or discriminant analysis, you can test and see if they really do hold up to be different. And you can get these cool 3D plots. That's one of the challenges, of course, to be able to convey these things that are complicated in a fairly simplistic way. And even some of the graphs can still end up fairly complicated. Okay, so why are we doing multivariate analyses? This is when you have more than one response to predictor variables. Think about what we've been doing all semester. We we'll always have one response on the y-axis with multiple predictors, whether they are categorical type of predictors or quantitative predictors, or times when we mixed the two and we have multiple versions of each of those. And this might also apply when you have multiple descriptors of units that you want to sort. You want to see if the, the groups are um, really oh, falling out into separate uh, groups, whether you predicted them in advance or you're just hunting to see if there are some patterns that you can simplify the data by. Okay, um, Imagine these data as being uh, related to ANOVAs, but not always. Sometimes it's just trying to describe the pattern without some sort of a p-value that separates the groups. Um, there are some pretty fancy analyses where you had a nice description and then you can try to see if you can um, iteratively sort out the pattern and find some significant groups. Um, but you can, you can do that without the ANOVA p-value kind of approach or with. And I say ish for the ANOVA because they're using approaches that are not always strictly related to the uh, old assumptions of analysis of variance. This is also remember uh, something that really helps to simplify and clarify data and so we use it a lot when we have complex data sets like morphological data. All the different ways you can imagine mo measuring skull morphology can be used to sort out these uh, different taxonomic groups, the pan genera uh, 
versus some of the other Homo and um, Australopithecine genera in between. So we have these complex morphological measurements of skulls. We have systematic data, whether it's molecular or other kinds of uh, data. And ecological data, of course, can be lots of variables that we can pool together and analyze in a multivariate way. All right, so I think there's a nice way to think about multivariate analysis that I lifted right out of McCune and Grace. They have a nice book that came along with a package called PC Ord, which is now um, replicated a lot in R. A lot of things that you could do in PC Ord are available in R. But they describe their software in that package very nicely with the advantages and the disadvantages. So I'm actually leaning on their book quite a bit here when I'm summarizing a lot of these things. And I should say, you can take an entire course on multivariate statistics. I have, and you still end up really combing through a lot of the details of these methods because there's so many options available to you in each of these branches on this tree. So um, this is going to be a simplification of those multiple options that you have available to you in this whole lecture. And in fact, uh, the lab course parts that we're going to be working on too will just be a subset, sort of the highlights of what's available to you in multivariate. So let's imagine you collect data on multiple responses to treatments. And so that mean, might be, for example, you do an experiment in a bunch of different communities. And of course, you go in and you collect data in the community. And you, you have data for each species within that community. So each data point might represent a species. So those are each responses to treatments. And then you might aggregate that together and measure things like diversity, right? Well, why might you aggregate to a diversity level? Why not just deal with all the original species level data well, this is, I think, a useful way to think about this in this flowchart. So you know, the beginning question would be, are the responses correlated? So for example, if I walk into a field and I sprinkle fertilizer all over the place, I might expect a lot of plants to all grow, and they would have some sort of correlated response to that fertilizer, right? And that means in a really broad sense. You expect some sort of positive responses, or maybe some negative ones, but there would be some sort of correlations going on among all the different species in those plots. So if I say yes, responses are correlated, then the question is, do I want to ignore those correlations among the response variables, or do I want to pay attention to those? If I want to ignore the correlations, then what I could do is move on up to this level here, where I'm going to say, do I then aggregate those to a higher level? And then if I do, if I just lump that into a diversity system, if I want to ignore the correlations, and I say yes, then do I aggregate them to a higher level? In other words, lump it down to a species richness or something. I would say yes, and therefore means I here I, I uh, obtain a simple univariate analysis of that response set of variables. So if I walk into my fields, I sprinkle fertilizer all over, I aggregate it down to a diversity level, that means that I am simply ignoring all those multiple species responses, and I'm analyzing then only diversity as a response to the treatments. That's how a lot of people do those analyses. Well, but notice that there was a fork in the road way back here. If the responses are correlated, and we choose not to ignore those correlations, what we're doing is retaining all of that raw information and using it in a multivariate analysis of responses. So we are not ignoring those correlations, and we're choosing to do a multivariate analysis because they, we think that they were correlated, and we want to use all that information rather than losing it by lumping it down into a simple diversity measure. Okay? If, on the other hand, the responses are not correlated, we could simply analyze each species by itself as a univariate analysis. And notice that that is one of the things we could have done back here. If we said responses are correlated, but we choose to ignore that, and we don't want to do diversity analyses as an aggregate, we could just simply divert back again to analyzing each species, or maybe the dominant species, by themselves. Okay? I hope that helps make some sense of why you would want to do a multivariate analysis. Essentially, what it's doing for you is retaining the correlation patterns, hanging on to them in aggregate that you consider important responses to the treatments or conditions that you're looking for. And rather than simplifying the data, you retain all that information and then let the computer and fancy algorithms inside the computer simplify the answer for you, but retaining all the raw variables, okay, or all the important pattern that might be there. Maybe a graphical example will help. I lifted this figure off of the internet because I thought it might work for us here. Let's say we have these three different groups that which we expected to maybe 
be different in some way or another, okay? And I have obviously three different measures for these groups. Axis 1, 2, and 3, right? So I have a 3D space where I have this data that is uh, representing these different clouds. Well, the way an ordination might work um, would be to first try to draw the first biggest axis that uh, I can draw a line through and find the closest distance to those points. So I'm going to imagine that that axis is along here. If I draw axis 1 along here, I'm capturing really a lot of the scatter along this plane here, along this axis, which isn't that wildly different from just drawing it along this first axis this way, right? A lot of the green points are going to be here, and a lot of the blues and reds are here. So all I've really drawn is a line that's closest to a bunch of the points, okay? And it comes up close to that back wall. I might not have drawn it very well. Now, so let's say that's my axis 1. And I, what I have then is the opportunity to draw the next axis, which will pick up the next set of data. And I could draw an axis on this way here. So it's capturing through the blues and the reds. In fact, I'm actually picking up the positions of the greens on that same axis, right? Some of them might be low down here, some, by, some of the green ones might be in the middle, and some of the green ones might be up high. So what I'm simplifying here is this three-dimensional object on essentially a two-dimensional plane, right? And I end up with a really cheesy version of points that are now just simply reducing that was what was a relatively complicated pattern down to a simplification. Well, obviously, my cheap example here is not a huge improvement over what was not overly complicated in the three-dimensional plot, okay? So my two dimensions is now a simplified version of the three dimensions. But think about this. What if you have far more dimensions than three? I can look at a 3D graph and sort of see the pattern. But if I have 100 species or 100 different kinds of measures, lots of different uh, polymorphisms that I measured, uh, lots of different um, microsatellites that I've measured, I can't constrict this to a simply 3D initial scatter. I've got a really complicated plot but I might still be able to reduce that really complicated plot, however many dimensions that might be, to something that is well represented in only two dimensions. Okay? That's what multivariate statistics are trying to do for us. We're simply trying to ordinate or cluster or something these patterns down. Okay? So what I've just described already for you is ordination. Let's jump ahead to talk about discriminant analysis. It's very related in that you are doing an ordination and then you have the opportunity to test and see if your categories are different. Now, discriminant analysis then is sort of this bridge between ordination and cluster analysis, where I think it is um, generating these, these ordination plots, canonical variates or canonical functions, just like we saw before with an ordination. But what you also have in this case are groups that you thought were already different. So you might already imagine groups 1, 2, and 3 as your a priori different groups and you want to test and see if those differences still hold true and you do that by doing that same process I just described as an ordination and then testing to see if your group memberships hold true. So clearly there's some overlap here. We might have some confusion on whether we're talking about group 2 or 3 as being the right name for let's say that brown asterisk there, right? It, we thought it was a group 2 initially and we might find out it's better described as a member of group 3. Okay. Maybe the same thing for these edges over here. And that's the point. Canonical variant analysis, or discriminant analysis, sometimes as it's called, is this kind of combination of testing groups and ordinations. Okay? All right. So then I'm going to jump ahead to another version of cluster analysis. I already showed you uh, a version of this with cars. Here's another example I found online that just is this idea that we're finding subsets within subsets and uh, trying to best represent the data trying to uh, reduce the amount of noise left over in each of these groups. So there's lots of different algorithms for that. I'm going to walk through those briefly. But the idea is that you are trying to find ordered groups to be able to pigeonhole complex data into, to simplify how you understand the data. Okay? All right, and finally, there's this thing called MANOVA, which is just simply multivariate ANOVA. It's just like ANOVA, but with multiple responses. And in that case, we get some sort of an output that might be a little bit different with we use R because we don't always use a Wilkes lambda, but it turns out to look very much like an ANOVA table. We have a p-value and degrees of freedom and f ratios for these interesting measures here that are different from the sums of squares, and you still get this basic 
ANOVA table where you can see certain terms are statistically significant and other ones might not be. So it's using multiple variables simultaneously, but otherwise doing the same job as an ANOVA. Okay? So if we think about those major categories now, I want to dive into each one a little bit. Let's talk first about ordination, and then I'll get around to uh, the discriminant analysis, the, uh, haha, what's the next one? Cluster analysis, there we go, and the MANOVAs. Okay. So the ordination is a simple way to organize data, and remember it's on that plane, that cheesy blue graph I drew there, um, where we have these uh, continua or gradients. The x-axis or the y-axis are these numbered scores, and we don't really worry about the units of those per se. We're just trying to organize the data in simplified ways. And so those gradients are each of those axes. And so what we're doing is we're explaining those multiple variables in terms of some smaller set of underlying dimensions. If I think about a species data set, and I have a bunch of different communities I've sampled, and you know I could have a bunch of species in total, I end up with actually the same number of axes as I have the number of species, which means that it could be really complicated, but obviously what we're hoping for is that the first few axes capture the majority of the information, okay? And sometimes they do quite well. So there's three main examples I want to share with you here. Principal Components Analysis, called PCA for short. Canonical Variant Analysis, which is also sometimes called Discriminant Analysis, and there's other names for that one. And Non-Metric Multidimensional Scaling. These are ways that you can do ordinations. And in fact, the Canonical Variant Analysis is sometimes applied to the entire method of, of Discriminant Analysis. I'm thinking of it as the first half, let's say the ordination half but that distinction is somewhat arbitrary. Let me talk about principal components first. That has been maybe the oldest ordination method. It's uh, the most widely known, perhaps. Um, and it's a, a classic method. But it has some challenges, which I'll talk about in a moment here. The scores are variables on those axes, and the idea is to maximize the differences among your samples. So each sample I take has values to it, and I want to try to spread out those patterns among the samples as best as I can. So every variable has its own axis. Every, every variable that goes into the analysis can ultimately be represented by an axis. If I'm drawing a line of clouds, uh, drawing a line through a cloud of points, I can keep doing that until I have drawn a line for every point that's hanging in that cloud, okay? So I get one axis per variable. Obviously, we want it to be simpler than that, so we hope the first few axes capture most of the story. So those highly weighted variables on an axis can be represented or combined there. I end up with a line that drawn through a cloud of points that hits or comes close to a lot of the points, and so those become well represented on an axis. Okay? The first axes explain most of the variation, and it downgrades from there. So we always hope that the first couple axes capture the majority of that information. To represent the pattern well. Okay? It's a pretty nice technique, but it has some assumptions. Those would include multivariate normality. And I say yikes there because you guys have already wrestled with trying to get data to be normal. And if you imagine lots of different data in your lots of different columns, imagine species in communities, well, you have to hope that every column is normal. And so, Multivariate normality is quite a challenge. You can get there. You can do log transformations, standardizations, things like that. That can help a lot. But you have to go through that same process you've been doing when you deal with any univariate data set, and that's a challenge. The other one, uh, the other yikes, is that you have homogeneous variance. That's the same problem we've had with univariate statistics, where you expect the bell curve for each column to be about as wide or as narrow as every other bell curve. Another big assumption, and that's something else to worry about. Now, that means that there's some risks with doing principal components when you have data that are not fitting those assumptions very well. Other ones that it's, I guess, a familiar assumption we've dealt with before is that you have independent random samples. And the, the other challenge that comes up to be um, a, a fairly large problem with principal components is you're assuming that you have linear relationships along the gradients and among the variables. So each variable would be essentially well represented in a linear pattern compared to every other variable, and that you have linear relationships along the gradients that you're going to map out as axes. Okay? So I think it's fair to say that there's some challenges with PCA. It has advantages, 
when you have linear relationships among variables, it works out quite well. That's really that what it's made for. It's ideal in those cases. And if you can get your data to be homogeneous variance and normality, or pretty close to it, by transforming, then it's fine. No problem with PCA. There are disadvantages. Those challenges of getting data to work that way are difficult in ecology and often not there by default. So it's not often satisfactory to do a PCA, even though that was the tool for a long time. It can give you a funny arch in the pattern. You get this kind of, um, I don't know, St. Louis arch uh, pattern in your data when you have a lot of zeros in the data. And that's because principal components is seeing zeros as being related to each other. When you might actually say, I didn't find that species in a site, the PCA is saying, oh, there clearly there's a pattern. Okay, So that artifact is one of the problems that took a while for people to understand in PCA. And it also turns out it's fairly sensitive to that homogeneity of variance assumption. Even moderate heterogeneity can cause problems with PCA. So people have tried to come around to other methods as well. Okay? Another one that people have used quite a bit is that first part of discriminant analysis called canonical variant analysis. <coughs> Excuse me. As I said, it's the ordination half of discriminant analysis. At least that's how I'm thinking about it. It actually comes together all in one fell swoop. But it's giving you an ordination. Now, the difference is that the scores on those axes that you get are actually maximizing the differences among groups that you already thought were there. So when you do a canonical variant analysis, you have to already say, these data come from this group, and those data come from a different group. That means that you've already listed in your data some groups in the canonical variant analysis. Principal components, you don't have to do that. It tries to sort those out for you as best it ca as it can. Canonical variant analysis, you're saying, I think these are in groups 1, 2, 3, etc., and let's see how well that works. Okay. Every variable still has its own axis, just like before, or another way to say that is one axis per variable. Same basic layout, in a way, as principal components, and how you try to think about the first axes being the most representative, ha highly um, capturing most of the variance is a really good thing in your first few axes. The highly weighted variables on an axis are represented really well there. So certain axes are correlated really nicely with certain variables, and you can say, well, this axis represents, so, oh, you know, this amount of fertilizer, or this kind of fertilizer, that kind of thing. So there are ways to interpret the axes very nicely. The assumptions are actually quite parallel to what we had with PCA, and that we have equal variance and normality, but notice we also have to say there's no multicollinearity, which is, again, a problem when you deal with these analyses, just like we've been playing with in regressions. And then independent random sample still applies, and if you're going to be assigning groups up front, you hope you have really clear-cut groups in advance, right? Okay. So you can see how canonical variant analysis is a tweak on principal components. It works well, too, when you have linear relationships and you have the same basic advantages as you do with PCA. The disadvantage is, again, just like PCA, that's a tough thing to find in ecology, data that play nice. And the linearity seems to also be pretty important, and, by the way, rare, to be able to say that you have linear relationships among variables. Same problem as in PCA. And homogeneity is still a pretty big problem, especially when you have small or unequal sample sizes. So what we have to think about then is, is there a method available to us that works when we don't have to sweat these assumptions, these classic statistical assumptions? Well, thank goodness there is. It's called non-metric multidimensional scaling. Quite a mouthful. And MDS, sometimes called MDS, sometimes called NMS. So I'm going to stick with N NMDS, if I can spit it out, although it's kind of interchangeable, if you'll see in the literature. Um, this is fundamentally different. This is essentially a non-parametric approach to the same problems we had with PCA and CVA. We want to do the same job. We want to try to find pattern. We want to simplify, but we're doing it in a different way. Data can be any scale. It doesn't matter. They can be arbitrary. They can be discontinuous. You can have categories. It's not a problem. You don't have to have normal data. That's really nice. That's a, a great assumption. And you don't have to sweat that linearity that we had to worry about in the other analyses. Okay? So it's based on an iterative process. It solves through a bunch of different rounds. It tries to sort out the data to obtain what is the lowest stress. Okay, we all hope for low stress, and stress is this measure of 
the original data, essentially you're measuring the distances between all the points in that cloud, and you're trying to find a pattern which um, gets that, uh, the difference in the original and the reduced uh, matrices, your, your axes that you're trying to simplify things on, to be as low as possible. So it's representing the original scatter as best as it can, but using a simplification. Okay, so it's trying to represent reality as best as it can. So a low stress means it's representing your data better. Okay, so there's a, a rule for stress I'll show you in just a moment. But notice that all of this is quite a bit different from what we were dealing with before, where we can relax about some of those assumptions that we had with principal components and canonical variant analysis. Okay, so the advantages then for NDMS, did I say that right? NMDS, there we go. It said it works well with lots of different kinds of data. You don't have to worry about those assumptions of homogeneity and normality and linearity. We let go of those problems. And there are other nice little tricks you can add into NMDS where you can still test and see if you have significant differences between groups. Some follow-on things which go along with NMDS, which I won't belabor right now. But know that it's not just simply looking at a cloud of points. There's ways to detect groups. Okay, That's also handy. Okay, the disadvantages as it used to be computationally intensive, only with, I'd say, the last 10, 20 years or so, easily 20 years, and so probably 10 years, do we have computers, laptops, that can even handle this. It used to be you had to go to a mainframe for this kind of stuff. So you can run circles around the mainframes of old, so it's not an issue anymore. You can do this. In other words, this first disadvantage doesn't really apply anymore. Okay, And you uh, need to try to get it as simple as you can, but you need to have a low stress score. Now, there's a bunch of different people who talk about how low is good enough. And a few different places I saw some layer between a 0.1 and a 0.2 is good. Obviously, lower is better. So I split the difference here, and I said it'd be great to try to aim for less than a 0.15 for stress. That's general guidelines I've been seeing in McCune and Grace's book and other places. So um, obviously, lower than that is better. If you got up above 0.15, it gets worrisome. You get up above 0.2, people start saying you don't have a really representative model of the data. Okay, And you need to think about then what you're doing. There are some bells and whistles in NMDS you have to learn about and mess with. It's not quite as autopilot as PCA, but it's not too bad. It's, it's all right. And if you use PCOR, it was a nice package. They even made it more autopilot than what you find in R, of course. Okay, so notice that the disadvantages are not too bad. This first one doesn't really apply anymore. Hopefully your data work out, but you don't have any control over that. You just want to be able to do that. And it means that you might have to represent a few more axes than two to keep uh, reducing the stress. Because remember, the more axes, the better you're representing the cloud of points. So to get down to only two axes, a simple plane, and get low stress is a great thing if you can find that, but it doesn't always happen. So then you represent your data with more axes, and it's a little more complicated to explain. That's all. And just like everything else we're doing in R, you have this disadvantage. You have to know what you're doing. Well, no kidding. And so, in fact, the disadvantages here are not severe. They're really pretty easy, and they grossly outweigh the, um, uh, the different problems that we had in the other analyses, where the advantages now for NMDS are those disadvantages for the other methods. So I would say, for the most part, NMDS is kind of a way to go. I think um, I would emphasize that one first if you're trying to figure out how to do an ordination. And principal components and canonical variant analysis come with baggage. And so it's probably easier to play around with NMDS. And what you get are some plots that look like this. I just found these online, some papers that were analyzing, for example, fungi in Borneo forests. They were either unlogged, logged once, logged twice, or an oil palm plantation. And notice that they're not drawing circles around these things. They're not groups in advance. But what we can do is test, like I said, accessory analyses that can say that, yep, sure enough, those are a different group from other ones, for example. So you see pretty often in N NMDS plots, they don't draw those ellipses around things. But you can look at the pattern. You can see, yes, the black filled circles are clearly different from the pluses. And in fact, they have a different pattern than the other symbols. They're more condensed. And down here to the left, these are more spread out this way. And notice that they reported the stress, less than 0.15, in this 2D plot. So that tells you that there's some pretty clear differences in the fungi between forests and Borneo. Okay? And that would be multiple species of fungi, a complex data set. Here's one for gut microbes by body weight. They had four different classes of people in body weights. And it looks like there's some pretty strong differences here 
in the kinds of gut microbes that they're finding. And of course, that would be a huge list of different observable taxonomic units based on molecular analyses. So there's lots and lots of data coming out of those kinds of studies. Here's one with legume diversity in West Central Africa. And I grabbed this one just to show you that you can have that same sort of idea. Here's a bunch of symbols over on one side, different from other symbols. But we also get these axes drawn in here. And these are ways to represent the, let's say it's nine different variables that we use to try to represent these different legume uh, diversities or explain them. And so they had these bio variables. Those are bioclim data. Those are climate data. And geology. And this is the distance varied here. So you can actually represent your cloud of points with the variables that helped explain the scatter as well. Okay, So there's a nice bunch of different ways to represent NMDS. Okay. All right, enough about NMDS. I'm going to try to get you guys to play with that in the class. Let's move on to discriminant analysis. Discriminant analysis, remember, was a sort of borderline between ordination and cluster analysis, where you arrange data along axes, but you can also test the categories. The same sort of thing you get with cluster analysis would be dividing things into categories. So here's a classic data set people use all the time for multivariate analysis. These are irises, where they measure the sepal lengths and widths, etc. So three different species of irises, and clearly two of them are a little bit more similar to each other than the third one, right? That's a, a data set everybody messes around with multivariate analyses because it's a really nice, tidy, clean data set that uh, people use to use uh, for examples all the time. So in a discriminant analysis, what we get here are these predefined groups. Remember, we thought we had three species of irises or something where we expect them to be different. And then it ordinates. It puts things out on those axes. It puts them in an ordination uh, on each axis. That's the canonical varied analysis part of it. And then the goal is to maximize the variation among groups compared to that within the groups. So it's really trying to tease apart those different patterns as best as it can. So it's maximizing the difference, the distance, let's say, between the reds and the greens, and maximizing the difference between the blues and the greens, etc. And when you do a discriminant analysis, it's trying to help you see the groups that you defined in advance as best as you can. All right? And what essentially what it's doing is taking all those independent variables, all the things you might call an, on an x axis, and treating those as predictors of groups, can you use all those things to predict groups. Okay? Then it tests to see if your predefined group assignments are right. And if you did it well, you would say, bam, I got it, I got 100% correct. Every time I said it was this. Uh, Satosa species, sure enough, it comes out right. I can clearly define that every time. And it might be slightly less than 100% when you get into some of this overlap between the blues and the greens, but generally that's going to, in this case, going to be a really low because it can draw a line pretty closely between those. So this percent correct then is a really nice way to try to um, uh, represent how well your predefined groups worked, how well you knew the system. And what we use this to do is to summarize the differences between groups. You have predefined groups you want to be able to say, and I know that there are these different groups, or eh, maybe these two s are not as close as I thought they were, etc. Okay? Test if those groups really differ, in other words. You can check to see which ones are misclassified. So for example, if I go back to that s this one, if, um, if I see some of the blues and the greens overlapping, I might actually look at this to see if I had misidentified that species by accident. Okay. You can use it to predict group membership, because now I have predictors that say, if you give me these kinds of measurements, it should be in that group or this other group. So I have these clear ways to identify groups. But notice the assumptions are the same ones that we saw before, homogeneous variance, multivariate normality, linearity, some of those risks that you have when you're playing around with normality and et cetera, et cetera, we've been dealing with in other data. So you still have to think about transformations, et cetera, when you're doing those canonical variant analyses or discriminant analysis in general. So here's that data plot again I've been showing you, but there's lots of other ones. And in fact, you can show the ones that are listed as errors that you misidentified by just giving them a different name and replotting them with a different color, right? So you can have these three different sets of data, and they might be pretty well distinguished but some other ones might have been misnamed the black dots in there, for example. Okay, So there's simple ways to try to represent the data. And notice that these axes don't really have units anymore. That's true for all these ordinations. They're in a unique set of units now. If I'm drawing a line of points through a cloud, it's on its own combination of those three axes in the room or in that 3D box. And so they're kind of unitless. Okay.
All right, let's get around to cluster analyses. These are trying to then divide things into subsets. You may not have known those things were going to be grouped in advance as we as you would with cluster, I'm sorry, with discriminant analysis. With cluster analysis, we're finding groups that may not have been there in our heads to start with, okay? And it can be hierarchical or it can be other approaches. This one's hierarchical that I'm showing you. The cluster analysis then is taking those entries and assigning them to groups and continually trying to refine that until it can't uh, reduce the noise any further. It can't make it any more clear. So you're simplifying, you're organizing data still. And so this is classifying things the same way we might use a dichotomous key to identify organisms, uh, the same way we as assign these things in different groups, uh, categorize them into different bins. We are clustering them. We're, we're putting them into um, matching groups. There's two main categories, in fact, for this classification. There's two main classifications of classification analyses, essentially. In the cluster analysis, you can do hierarchical clustering or non-hierarchical clustering. There's other ways to spin this, but those are the two main splits I've seen. Hierarchical clustering is that nested subsets kind of approach. Let me go back to that graph. This is a hierarchical clustering diagram. Each of these sets is, is inside another set, inside a set, etc., all the way up, right? So it's hierarchical nested, and it makes these diagrams called dendrograms because they look like branches on a tree, okay? And then the flip side is there are non-hierarchical clusters where the goal is really just trying to make a group fit as well as it can to reduce the variance inside the group for some number of groups that you already specify. You can say, I think there's five groups here. Try and find the five groups as best you can to try to make those as clear as possible. Obviously, it's really nice to already know or have a prediction for a number of groups if you're doing this non-hierarchical approach. What it's trying to do is find some stable sets of entries. So. Imagine I'm adding or, uh, data entries into a group and it's holding up pretty well, but now I throw a new one in and it changes the definition of the group. Well, clearly that would not be a very stable group. I would need to try to maybe reassign that to another set. There's a usual approach for non-hierarchical clustering called k-means clustering. I think that's pretty common. I've seen that used fairly often. Um, master's student just recently used it, for example, in her defense. Um, there's another approach I just want to clue you into called mclust, where it's using a whole different way to go about this, and I'm thinking it might be pretty cool. We'll see how time tells on that one, but it looks like it's getting away from some of the problems with k-means clustering, and in fact, it allows you to try to uh, identify the number of good groups before you even have a number. So this is all based on Bayesian analyses, and it looks like it's a really simple set of commands. Just let it roll. So it might be a great way for people to do non-hierarchical clustering going forward. What's been a lot more common, I think, has been the hierarchical clustering, those dendrograms. So let me walk through some of that briefly. There's a bunch of different methods for hierarchical clustering method uh, uh, analyses. There's nearest and farthest neighbors. There's medians. There's averages. There's centroids, which is like a center of gravity in a cloud of points. There's Ward's method, which is also called Orlochi's method. There's a flexible beta. There's a McQuitties. Oi! This is all from McCune and Grace, and it's repeated, in fact, in uh, the, the R documentation, although R seems to have left out the flexible beta one, but all the others are described in the R documentation. So, with this list of methods, you might be saying, what do I do? How do which one do I use? I would say you've probably seen the GMA one, if you look at clustering diagrams much. Upguma, however you say this, it's the unweighted pair group method. It's essentially called the average method, or group average, or average linking. That's pretty common. Um, there's a lot of choices, and one of the problems is that you have to be really careful. What you get in one of these diagrams, what you the, the kind of diagram you get, is very much dependent on the method that you choose. You could take the exact same data set, choose different methods, and you're going to get quite different diagrams, quite different dendrogram branching patterns with the different methods. So what does that tell me? It tells me that your answer is just a matter of how you did it, not necessarily what the data actually are trying to tell us. So I'm myself nervous about putting too much weight on hierarchical cluster, clustering methods. I've used them. They're useful to try to see the data, to try to confirm things, or to try to um, summarize patterns. But I'd be nervous about putting too much faith into what they're telling you. 
there's um, this nice website here that shows you that problem. If you try a couple different methods, you get some big mismatches in the data. And they do it with some really nice graphical kinds of uh, output that you can see th the results. And in fact, Yukun and Grace cut to the chase finally at the end of their chapter on these things where they recommend Ward's method using relative Euclidean distances. So that's based on lots of different years of people arguing about these methods and they say that that reduces some of the problems. In fact, the UPGMA one that you see quite often is not very well recommended. So anyway, you can tell that I'm a little nervous about using these clustering methods and if you use it, you have to be pretty clear on how you did it and choose your method well. All right, let's move on to MANOVAs, which, like I said, is just an ANOVA, but using multiple responses. And just like I said before, too, if you were using uh, SAS, you'd get every one of these kinds of methods that would spit out. It's essentially giving you uh, an F ratio and degrees of freedom and a p-value, the same as any sort of ANOVA would. And notice that you can get slightly different measures in significance values for these different types of estimators here. But they're usually not wildly different, and they usually don't tell you a huge uh, different answer. So, in fact, it turns out that um, R uses Pelé's trace by default. Okay, so the multivariate analysis of variance is back to this kind of a thing again. If you see multiple responses that are correlated, and you want to retain that information, then you do this multivariate analysis of variance. If you wanted to ignore those correlations and you aggregate things down to a simpler measure, a diversity kind of score, you would end up doing a simple ANOVA. So the top row here, going up, 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 would lead to an ANOVA, whereas what we would be doing here is diverging and not simplifying into a diversity kinds of measure and retaining all the raw data to do a MANOVA. Okay? So what we're going to do is work with uh, the same data set as we would have did um, PCA or any of these other things, but we just do an analysis of variance on it to evaluate c different categories and see if they're significantly causing patterns in the, all the response data simultaneously. We still have to think about these things in terms of their linear responses. Um, they're supposed to be linear related, and so you have to think about things as being transformed. That's still a problem here when you're doing a MANOVA, the same way it might be if we did with an ANOVA. In addition, then, we have to hope that those transformed data might be Norm normally and homogeneously uh, distributed for variance. So it's the same initial problems we had with ANOVAs that you're so frustrated with and familiar with by this point in the semester. Okay, so first um, what we do to do a, a MANOVA, it's really simple. You just make a variable composed of all your responses. So let's call it Y, and I would simply bind together my columns Y1, Y2, Y3, etc. And then just like running analysis of variance, I would just say MANOVA my model, right? And summary model. It's really no big magic. Instead of ANOVA, we say MANOVA. It's done. Okay? And so you get this output. The only trick is you make this one variable, this one response, which is representing a bunch of columns. So it's essentially a, you know, a data frame called Y that has all your data in it. And use that as your response variable. So that Y there is actually representing a bunch of data simultaneously, right? And so the default result, like I said before, is this Pelé Bartlett statistic other ones are out there. I think the default is probably fine because they're not wildly different in how they tell you the answer. I do want to tell you about another workaround for perma called uh, Permanova. It works around the normality assumptions for the MANOVA. There's this vegan package in R which does a lot of different kinds of multivariate analyses. And inside of vegan is this thing called ADONIS, which is actually an acronym. I forget what it stands for. Um, and so it's using permutations, it's using randomizations in the data to avoid the problems with normality assumptions that you might have. So if you have data that's hard to get transformed, then you just say, ah, I can't do a MANOVA. You could say, oh, but wait a minute, there's this PERMANOVA thing I could try, and I get around that problem with normality, okay? You're still supposed to have about equal spread, which is like saying uh, about homogeneous variance. But it turns out people have been analyzing it, and they found that Permanova is not nearly as fraught with that problem. That assumption is not quite as big a deal, let's say, as it is for other methods to evaluate differences between multivariate groups called NOSIM and MRPP, which, by the way, can go nicely with NMDS, this MRPP thing. So the Permanova 
turns out to be a pretty robust way to go about these things when you have problems in MANOVA with getting normality and homogeneous variance. It's also an alternative to the analysis of molecular variance, the AMOVA kind of approach, and it's analogous to something called redundancy analysis you might hear about if you start thinking about multivariate analyses. Okay, so we've just walked through a, a quick bl blizzard of a bunch of different methods. I was really trying to lump them down into these categories. Ordination, discriminant analysis, cluster analysis, and MANOVA or PERMANOVA. Okay? I'm going to color code these four categories over here. And over here are the major methods that I would say apply to each of those general categories of analyses. Principal components analysis is really easy to do in R. You just say PR comp and it comes in the basic stats unit. You don't have to load an extra package in. To do canonical variant analysis, which remember is partly an ordination, you just simply say LDA, that stands for linear discriminant analysis, in the mass package, which we've already been using this semester. To do NMDS, you do this thing called a meta MDS inside the vegan package, and there's going to be a bunch of bells and whistles that go along with that one. So you have to sit down and learn how to specify the certain details inside the meta MDS command. LDA is pretty simple to spit out, and so is PR comp. M meta MDS, you have to specify some of the options a little bit more carefully. All three of those, as I'm trying to show here with the black lettering, are ways of doing ordinations. Okay? If you want to do discriminant analysis, it really is still that LDA thing. It's the same stuff as a canonical variant analysis, where then you can also test and see which categories were described correctly, uh, the categories you had a priori. To do cluster analysis, to divide things into subsets, there's hierarchical clustering, where you have each cluster, and then again you can specify the methods inside the details that come with that simple command in stats. And notice that that's this base unit that we have in R. And then you also have k-means, which is a way of doing clustering, again, in that basic stats package. And you can specify some of the details to go with k-means as well. Okay? So you have those two different main ways of doing clustering already available in R very easily. And then finally, this permanova or manova thing, you can do manova really simply, again, like I demonstrated there, or, or at least show you brief code, in the stats package. Adonis is a, actually it's a pretty simple command. You specify a model just like you would in an ANOVA. Um, and it's inside the vegan package, and I've used that quite a bit, and it works quite well, i got to say. So I'm kind of a fan of Permanova. I'm nervous about some of the clustering analyses. The hierarchical clustering is really fraught with uh, differences due to methods. K-means clustering might be more robust, but you have to have specified how many groups you think you have in advance. Okay? There might be some new ways to get around that with using Bayesian uh, kinds of analyses. The mclust package might be really slick. Linear discriminant analysis is pretty handy, but it has the same basic assumptions that we have for principal components and for MANOVA, and so you have to be careful about some of those assumptions, but it can be really nice. I like it when those assumptions are legit. And NMDS is probably the most robust way to deal with ordinations because you are free of those restricting assumptions that I've been talking about and you've been hammering all semester. Okay. That was a lot. I think you're going to have a pretty good chance to play with those in the lab. I think you'll see how it's going to work. Um, I'm going to just stick to those four main categories. We're not going to sweat lots of differences between lots of different kinds of ordinations and lots of different kinds of clustering and stuff like that. But you'll have a chance to dip your toe in that deep pool, and at least you'll be able to come back to those again another time when you're messing around with them in your thesis, etc. All right. That's enough for now, and I'll see you in class. Bye.